Thank you so much. And uh, once more with feeling. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about something very exciting, and it's great news for all of us and our children and our grandchildren. And what it is is it's the coming prosperity that America is going to enjoy. And it's because of two uh, energy technology events. The first one is the intercosm, and it's how, because of the internet, uh, energy systems are now organizing themselves like biological systems. And that's important because it's going to squeeze uh, waste out of our energy systems. And that's important because the number one use of energy in the world is the extraction, refining, and distribution of energy. So there's lots of good to be gotten out of that. The other thing is the shale gale, which is happening about 100 miles north of us in northwest Pennsylvania and, and other places in the country that is making America the cheapest place in the world for energy. And these two things are the invisible drivers of this new era of prosperity. And it's important that we understand them because our government is thinking about how they're going to protect us from what's happening in energy. And, and, and it's important for us to think about this in terms of what do we want for our government, from our government, and how do we want to organize ourselves. So we've always had thought leaders in every generation, whether it was Thomas Malthus in, in 1750 to, to 1830, or whether it's Al Gore, who are what I call the prophets of doom. And what these prophets do is they think about the world in terms of how, in the case of Malthus, exponential growth in population would outstrip the arithmetic ability of our society to be able to produce food, and what undesirable consequences that would have. That's exactly what Al Gore is saying, is, is that our society is going to produce exponential increases in carbon dioxide, and that's going to maybe make us die off as a, as a population. So we really need to think about what these people are telling us. And so it's not that they're bad people. They really are trying to warn us about this. But we, as citizens and as decision makers for ourselves and our families, need to think about, well, how do we want to react to these things? Do we want to buy into this? Or do we, is there really this great new reality? And, and what each generation has found is that these thoughts of finite resources and the unintended consequences are always completely outstripped by mankind's, by societies creative genius and our adaptability. And that is what is so exciting. And so we need to encourage that type of, of activity. So what's happened to mankind is kind of incredible. Uh, it, it, it basically 66,000 years it took for 300 million, for our population to grow from a couple thousand to 300 million people. And then it took until 1830 when Malthus died for the population to reach 1 billion. And then in 200 short years, our population grew from a billion to 7 billion. And what's interesting is we got more prosperous. We had middle classes. Why did all this happen? Well, it happened for one simple reason, and that is energy technology. Bolton and Watts in the late 1700s invented the steam engine. And that changed our energy supply from wood which was very carbon intensive, to, to coal. And that allowed urban, urbanization, it allowed industrialization, and, and prosperity. And so what historians say is that by building these steam engines, and later it was outstripped by the internal combustion engine, that what happened was our society built a system of muscles. And, and our society thrived. So now what's happening is is that we're developing a brain. And that really started in like around 1996. It was enabled by the government's funding of the ARPANET. But it wasn't that the government sort of, the reason the ARPANET and, and the intercosm society, economy that I'm gonna talk about happened and why it was so powerful was because the government decided not to control it, but to give it to us as a tool to make the world better for ourselves. So, Probably the concept, well, the concept that Albert Einstein said was the eighth wonder of the world that's least understood by people is the power of exponential growth. And New, uh, Newsweek did a, uh, a survey of 90% 90, 90 of the people they asked would rather have $10,000 than a penny 
that doubled every day for 30 days. And that's like a really good decision to take the $10,000 until like the second, what they call half of the chessboard. And it becomes $10 million. So we really need to understand this issue of arithmetic increases versus exponential increases. And what's powerful about the intercosm is exponential increases and how these systems work. So this guy named Alfred North Whitehead was a mathematician. He understood this. And what he said was, civilization advances with the more important operations we can, can, can perform without having to think about them. You can think about many ways that this is affecting our life right now. But this is what's happening with energy systems. Energy systems, the intercosm, is essentially vast numbers of sensors that are put on energy consuming assets or producing assets that are invisibly and automatically managing our energy infrastructure. So things that used to be done manually are now being done automatically, and this is producing this advance in civilization, which is more profound. And unfortunately, it's not something that you look at. It's invisible, right? So there's no photo ops for the politicians, right? There's no you know, symbols like solar cells or wind farms for us to embrace. It's just happening around us. So the, um, the, the best example of, of this is a company that my company created called Converge. And what we do, and you can see it on every public bus in, uh, in Delaware, is we make these load switches that go on air conditioners. And we're connected to smart thermostats in your home. And what happens is the utility company, when there's about to be a blackout or a brownout, pushes a button, and within 30 seconds, it sends out a signal over public pager networks, and it dials back the demand of the air conditioners. Air conditioners are the number one uh, reason for peak demand of electricity. Now, why does this matter to our society? Why is it clean? We were named by Newsweek as one of America's 10 most eco-friendly companies. It's important because it's very difficult to store electricity for more than a couple minutes, for a couple of seconds, basically. And so to be able to build a grid, to be able to accommodate the eight hours of peak demand for electricity, you've got to want, build one that's about twice as big as you really need. Or you can use demand response, this industry that we created, and use it to basically squeeze it, to shape the, the supply to fit the demand. Uh, to shape the demand to fit the supply, excuse me. And this is a really impactful idea and a great example of the intercosm. So one of the neat things about technology is it's combinatorial. It's, it's the combination of ideas coming together in a unique way. So the intercosm is these three unstoppable events. It's the digitization, it's the ability to be able to control that air conditioner and be able to cycle it in a way that you as a household cannot know that, that you're actually, it's changing the temperature in your house. This concept of Moore's Law, which is decreasing the cost of that control of the, of the chips, of the number of transistors you can put on a, on a chip, and then the connectivity, connecting different devices that have never been connected before together. Like, like, what do you need a public pager network for? Well, you need it to dial back all this. You know, nobody uses pagers anymore. You use it to dial back the air conditioners. So this is going to mean unprecedented prosperity. And you start seeing things like last month's issue of Time Magazine that talks about the smart home. We've all seen the advertisement on television where the father is asking, you know, it is a vacation home, and he... He gets a call from his son. He said, did you turn off all the lights in the house before you left? And the son says, sure, we did. And the, son, the dad goes and looks on his, on his cell phone. And he says, yeah, sure, you did. He turns out the lights, and he you know, closes the doors and makes certain the sump pump's working. There's a lot of things that this, that this connectivity is bringing to us. Another thing that the intercosm is solving is a people crisis. The average age of a member of the Society for Petroleum Engineers is 55 years old. So these people are sort of more thinking about retirement. They've got these valuable experiences. How are we going to transfer these valuable experiences to the young people that you know, would like to have jobs in this sector, and how do we keep producing this energy? So what, what's happening right now is that the way the intercosm is working is they're taking these very experienced older workers, and you're putting them in control rooms, and you're putting them in four, four or five uh, TV screens that are attached to younger workers who are out on oil rigs with GoPro cameras on their heads, and the older guys are telling the younger guys and women how to, that's how we're leveraging our talent across this energy infrastructure. So another example of how energy is as infinite as the human imagination is a Greek, son of a Greek immigrant named George Mitchell who came to our country. And 
he became an oil and gas entrepreneur in Texas. And he had a bunch of gas wells, and he was running into a problem. The problem was the gas wells were running out of gas, and he was in danger of going out of business. Around the same time, Alan Greenspan addresses Congress, and he says, we are going to run out of natural gas. We need to start immediately building LNG importation facilities into our country. George Mitchell doesn't have the power of the US government behind him. So what he does, he starts thinking about this. He says, you know, when I drill, normally you drill with conventional oil into a pool of gas or a pool of oil, and, and it's relatively easy to find those pools using seismic technology. He says, you know, when I drill through the shale layers, they're very thin, I get a poof of natural gas or a, poof, or, or a little bit of oil, but not enough to really make any money. And it's these long, thin layers of shale. So he says, what if I turn the drill bit, and I could turn, drill horizontally, and I could treat that thin layer of shale as if it was you know, a huge reservoir of oil. And they said, what if I could figure out how to frack and break that rock? And then what if I could use slick water? And, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm compressing over a period of, you know, it happened over 10 years, but this guy's creative genius and the oil and gas creative genius created a situation where the US is now the lowest cost source of hydrocarbons in the world. And it's dramatic. Against our trading partners, our cost of natural gas is around north of $4 per MCF versus like $12 in Europe and $16 in Japan. Well, this is causing a huge problem. For the Europeans, they're looking at the loss of the EIA just came out and said as many be as many as 30 million jobs because they have such a disadvantage when it comes to the feedstocks unless they harness their creative imagination and figure out a way to take advantage of it. And Europe, by the way, has lots of shale. The Paris Basin, right underneath the Eiffel Tower, they have enough oil and gas in shale to be able to be self-sufficient, but they won't allow themselves to drill for that oil. So, so this, is, this is a huge advantage the US has. So what has fracking done for you and I personally? Um, the IHS has estimated that that, is at, that, that the natural gas fracking has lowered our energy bills by $1,200 per household. Now, just to put this into context, the average Delaware household has $2,000 of disposable income, and 50% of Delaware households have no disposable income. So a $1,200 uh, windfall is very meaningful to most people. The other thing it's done is create a lot of jobs. The actual oil and gas industry has grown by 25%. If anybody wants a job, move to Williston, uh, Williston, North Dakota, or move to uh, the Permian Basin, or the Marcellus Shale area. These are areas that once you couldn't get a job, now you, know, you have to wait two hours in line to get a pizza. It's, it's, it's incredible how robust it's been. And what's, the other thing that's kind of interesting is, is that there's still a long way we can go. What's happened is seismic technology, which is also, I call it digital energy, has basically gone from being able to get 25% of the oil out of a subsurface to 3D seismic, about 40 to 50% of the oil out of the reservoir before it's completed, uh, considered depleted. And we've developed a technology uh, called 4D seismic, which we think will be able to get it to 65 to 75%. So, so this, we're unlocking the creativity of the geologists. Um, and we're also developing the first new seismic tool in 50 years. So what's been happening is, our energy systems have been decarbonizing. So this is a, since 1900, the uh, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change has said that there's been a dramatic decrease in the number, amount of carbon in our energy sources from wood to coal to natural gas. And that's gonna continue. As a matter of fact, the other good news is our carbon dioxide levels are back to 1964 64 levels on a, on a household, per household or per capita basis. That's really alarming considering, you know, think about the personal computers and the TVs, all the electric, electricity consuming appliances we have today that we didn't have in 1964. So we're, we're actually doing quite a good job with this. Other EIA, Energy Information Agency data, says that despite the fact that our consumption of electricity has gone up 200% since the 1970s, our total aggregate emissions are down by 60%. So, why do we have such bad energy policy? Well, one story I like to tell is that Alfred Nobel was an engineer, and when he died, he put in his will that his two tr most trusted advisors, both engineers, he wanted them to administer the Nobel Prize. 
they had no interest in the public policy aspects, like most engineers, and he dele they delegated it to a lawyer, and as a result, we have Nobel Prizes for almost everything, but not engineering. Okay. <laughs> so our, our engineers need to be interested in public policies. They're not, so as a result, we're basically getting legislated by 22-year-old legislative assistants who think they know about energy. And so Delaware is a microcosm. So America is gonna thrive because of this entrepreneurial boom in shale. There's been no shale fracking on federal lands. It's all been on private lands or state lands. So Delaware finds itself in a situation where we're only 100 miles from the Marcellus Shale, yet we're at a $575 million energy disadvantage. Our costs are, are dramatically more than adjacent states, and that adds up to about $600 per household. Now, why is that? One reason is, is because we don't have enough natural gas fired plants here, and we don't have a pipeline. We don't get enough natural gas into Delaware. We need to build a pipeline to eliminate that $400 million disadvantage to our companies and our households. The other problem is, is our state has a renewable portfolio standard, which means the government has decided we want to have solar, we want to have wind, we want to have bloom boxes. Well, that costs about $125 million a year to our costs. And, and then the last thing is, so I think we need to get rid of the new renewable portfolio standards. Now, that doesn't mean I'm against solar and wind. I just think that they should stand on their own. And there are ways that we can have cheaper energy with a smaller carbon footprint and save our households money. The last issue is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And uh, this means that it's a, basically a carbon tax that adds about $50 million to our electricity bills per year. And um, I think we ought to revoke the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, New Jersey's already left. Pennsylvania never took, uh, took part in it. So we're, we're sort of handicapping ourselves. We have $24 million in the, in the SEU, which is the, uh, you know, a, a, a government organization which is designed to fund solar projects. They haven't spent a dime. So let's get that money out of the government's hand. Let's put it back into households' hands who need it. So here's an example of building a natural gas plant, a 300 megawatt natural gas plant, would cut our uh, NOx emissions, which is smog, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide in half. And instead of adding $200 a month, a year to our electricity bills, it would reduce our electricity bills by $200. So if you really care about the environment and you don't care whether you get these symbols of solar or wind, natural gas is the thing we should be embracing. So why should energy be cheap? Ask the 375 people who lost their jobs at Everaz. Everaz steel plant in Claymont closed for two reasons. Number one, our energy costs are 100% higher for industrial uh, consumers of electricity in Delaware than in adjacent states. And second of all, we have a, a gross receipts tax that means they have to pay taxes even if they're losing money like they were. So Bill Gates asked the question, you know, why should we care? Why should we be involved? It's because we always underestimate what can happen in the next two years. We always, uh, we always overestimate what can happen in the next two years. We underestimate what can happen in the next 10 years. There's an incredibly exciting future ahead of us. Delaware has got to organize itself, build a pipeline, be a part of the shale gas revolution, and and Delaware can avoid the path we're on, which has become a jobless wasteland uh, and uh, next to neighbors that'll be benefiting from. Thank you very much.